So I wanted to go into a bit more depth with this with this uh, horse painting and I wanted to sort of go over a few things that I that I feel is fundamental to the blobby way of working. Um, I don't think it, I can make it entirely clear within this one image with this one video but um, I want to do the best I can to explain certain concepts that um, that are integral to to my way of thinking when I'm when I'm working. This process is sort of a mix of observation and design. Um, it's not entirely. It's it's part of it is about being responsive to the the source material, but it's about taking that and taking it into your own your own personal realm. And I think color is a great way to do that. So color, I think, is one of the most important things to establish early on. If we know we're going to be working with color later on down the line, or it's an important aspect to our image, then it really has to be, it really has to be uh, established and understood at an earlier stage because these are essentially what you're going to be using to draw the rest of the image. So early on in these earlier stages, I, I put down a, a, a few colors here or there. I simplified the image down to essentially a relationship between orange and pink, orange being the predominant one. You see, I, I initially put down a kind of a greeny orange because I, I saw some of those in, but it wasn't really doing it for me, so I correct it by using something a little bit more warm. And um, I make that small adjustment. Then I add kind of a dirty pink for the horse. We can't. I, I feel like in the other stages we can't really know what we want unless we have something that's already down, uh, already put down to be able to respond to and make subsequent decisions um, based upon where you want your image to go. And uh, the clearer we can make these decisions, the, the the more obvious it is to us, the easier it is to go forward. Uh, I feel. And so it's really why I try to establish a lot, like as much as I can in the earlier stages uh, and have an almost complete but shitty image uh, of um, what it is that we're kind of working with. Uh, so from there, we can then see what is working, what isn't working and all the elements that are roughly in place for the image to be able to manipulate them, change them, and bend them to our will, essentially. I, I tend to prefer to work with color more than tone, if I can help it, in dis distinguishing sh certain shapes early on. I will use like dark if I need to, if, or if it's very obvious, but even then I will still like to inject it with some color. So here the, the blacks or the, the very darks are a very dark, dirty brown, essentially. I've still kept it within that orange color gamut that I, that I set out for myself, um, uh, that I established for myself very uh, early on. I start with the most simplified drawing devices. So I might start more with horizontals, verticals, um, diagonal lines perhaps, which would be more in line with a, a sort of classical atelier style of uh, translating shapes and objects. Um, just and because you can do it quite, you can do it quite quickly and immediately. Um, but I don't like to 
stay with that for too long, just to kind of plot things out. Um, and you can kind of do it in a sort of spot the difference way if, if you have a, a setup that is accommodating of that. So with this one, that's exactly what I did. Because I wanted to get the rough, the rough scene and the rough shape proportions, I, I had the two images side by side and was working in, a, in not, not quite, but an almost one-to-one -one, um, image, image um, ratios. So I could sort of, I could bring, I could bring horizontals over um, if I needed to. I, I tend to not rely too heavily on it because I don't want to be stifled. I want to like figure out the drawing as I go. Uh, um, but I, I have that for maybe certain shapes like or objects and where, and where they might line up. Um, but again, just a rough approximation, about a 60% um, approximation, just or as long as it's more correct than it was before, that's just the main important thing. So the horse is not really a horse, it's just a sort of a, a triangle shape with a head and two little legs. Um, that's all I want to kind of reduce it to at this point. I really don't want to overthink it. I need these other shapes in play first, uh, and I want to see their sort of proportional relationships um, with sort of as little colour as I can. Um, put into them. I, like, I know the floor is a bit more orange than everything else, and I know, like, the lamp is a little bit more yellow, so I, I, I make a very simplified decision to change that. I just shift the, the, the color wheel a little bit, have it still in this kind of brown town, but um, a, a little bit different. I, I don't want to be adding too many colors just yet, but I, I, I can't use pink there. I can't really use that orange. It needs, it, it's a separate element. It needs a separate, it needs a separate color, basically. And you see like with, with, uh, with uh, certain elements of the backdrop here, um, I put in a bit more color and then I, I go back and put in um, whatever sort of more instinctively feels like needs correcting. Um, and if, if, I, if I'm in one area for too long, I might flip around and go to an area on the other side of the canvas and make sure there's not an imbalance being created. Like I, I could focus on this left side entirely. I think I do a lot more, um, like where this horse is coming up against the left, the left um, lamp. I, I pay more attention to that relationship and the horse uh, with the curtain that's just behind it. I pay attention to those more than anything, but the dis the other distances I pay less attention to because I don't really perceive them as as that fundamentally important. Um, like it's kind of working uh, without too much uh, too much observation of of those exact relationships. If it, it, and and if it's working without a kind of over, like an over observation, then it works. Um, and it could work better. Like for all I know that the lamp on the right could could serve the image more if it was more tucked into the left um, or more distance to the right. Um, but I just want to place it where I kind of feel like it should go. Um, but at the moment I don't even really put it in because it, it's sort of on the edge and uh, I kind of know where it will fit. I can kind of uh, make that uh, judgment. So I, I try and see with, the, with these other colors that I introduce where else they can kind of fit in until they just look wrong. And then I know I will need to uh, make another micro adjustment of their, of their tone. You see, like I, I use black um, uh, to draw some line a little bit, um, like s some more conceptual line of like the horse shape or like the box shape of it or perspective. I'm using line, but 
um, it's sort of just a very thinned out tone of what I already have uh, as like this darker black brown shape. Um, it's it's very I think I felt it was very important to use these darks to to really really help me plot certain points because that contrast uh, is really easy to instinctively um, spot the difference if I'm flicking my eyes back and forth the kind of the light against dark is is a very easy way to um, measure proportions and stuff like that so they, they were important to put in fairly early on uh, in this image um, but just again very simple shapes I don't want to get into the exactitudes of of what even the objects are yet they're just sort of compositional devices and um, shapes in which to help me uh, get a more developed sense of proportion and that's that's all all these marks really are it's me trying to get a sense of proportion get a sense of the image um, and along the way, some of these very early decisions I make end up staying to the end because they were they were good enough uh, for what I needed, and uh, that's handy. So a lot of the marks that I make in these drawings are sort of a little little almost tests um, of proportions uh, without like putting everything in just like little blobs of an eye or or, or or a line here or there just to kind of slowly sculpt and push it more within where I feel like it needs to be but never over committing on those things just giving like a hint essentially um, a lot of the times I like to use uh, sort of proportional uh, geometry type lines, to, like for instance, like a center line on a face, or or maybe um, perspective lines, seeing where things might be going back to uh, make sure that there there is an inherent strong uh, sense of geometry where it might need it. It's not always needed. Perspective you can get away with like fucking up a bit or like it being wonky or, or flat. It like we don't need full on um realism when it comes to things like perspective because we're making images. We're not necessarily um those things aren't really that necessary uh for it to be just like life. So I, I want to establish these these uh, colors earlier on because then I want to be able to use those and you see I, I color pick quite a lot from the, the colors that I have laid out for myself which is essentially the same as maybe pre-mixing a color and then using it. I, I, I want to get them like you know 60% right perhaps like just enough um, to be correct um, and then push them around manipulate them around with that with their shape and uh, their interactions until I, there's a sense of, of harmony within the image, uh, or until I reach like an impasse and I need a new color in there to, to add to uh, the kind of feel that I'm that I'm getting. Um, I might look to areas to see can I reduce the contrast there? Can I pump up the the intensity or dull down the intensity? I keep everything roughly in this uh, mid-tone, um, kind of quite compressed values, working with mid-tones and darks more than anything. I don't like to work with lights this early on. Um, so it's sort of like working dark to light, but it's more like working mid to dark to light. Um, because I, along the way, I still want to, I still want to work out how contrasted I want my image to be or how compressed I want the values to be. It's still not something that I would have worked out yet. Contrast is a very powerful tool to emphasize certain areas, emphasize certain shapes, and I don't know whether I want 
to use uh, or or like use the same uh, contrast levels that the the reference image has sort of laid out for me. I don't necessarily want to um, adhere to that uh, if I don't know if it's going to be of my overall benefit. Um, so I keep things roughly in in the, the mid tone area, and I. Um, I, I then sort of go from there. Um, you see with this image, it sort of, it, it goes from middle and then over time it does get more contrasted as certain areas also become less contrasted. So you can see like with the uh, thing, like when talking about anchor points, you can see the horse's eye as being one of them. You see, I, I put it in, then I paint over it again, and I, and I shift it around a few times uh, in relationship to other shapes around it until it just looks right, until it just looks right within my image. I don't really want to think too much how it compares to the image I'm working from, because remember, no one's really going to be seeing that, um, apart from you guys. But... Uh, no, you know, it's it's entirely irrelevant. Um, it only, the, your image only needs to work within itself. So as long as it looks right in your, on your canvas, then it is right. That's the only really thing we can use to, um, to uh, determine whether it's correct or not. And so that's why we need a lot of elements in play earlier on to have things to compare it to um, or at least not too many elements but big fundamental core elements that you know are important um, I want to establish my parameters so I know what I'm going to be working within and what I'm not um, cut that out with a few decisions earlier on in my intent of what I'm trying to achieve. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have to be realistic about um, our expectations with an image. And not always, we're not always trying to make something really final and complete each time. It's, it's not really the purpose of, of making imagery. Um, it's more of a continuous exploration of trying to find our own vocabulary. When working like this, I, I, I wanna I wanna see what I can get away with with as little as I can. Staying with the most limited amount of variables uh, as I can, so that in, in this instance it's removing blending from the equation just so I can um, focus purely on fields of color and how they are working uh, with one another before I add another element and um, kind of muddy the water because if you really uh, simplify uh, certain aspects of your 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 process um, at least earlier on you can much easily more easily tell uh, what it is that needs to change um, because you only have uh, like very few options of which that could be you so say with color earlier on it's I, I like to think is it just too warm too cool or uh, is it intense enough or is it dull enough um, I only really want to think maybe in these uh, few ways after I picked like the hue um, because it makes uh, my uh, ch choices a lot easier uh, or makes me see what to do next uh, a lot clearer essentially um, because I, I know it's only a matter of a few things so I'm not really an expert on like horse anatomy all that much I've drawn them a little bit but n not a lot um, so really um, I had to rely on um, just a lot of its silhouette in trying to get what it is, but also 
a visualization of, of, of form a little bit. Um, I don't think you need to know the anatomy of everything to be able to draw it, but I think you need to know, or it helps to know, uh, how three-dimensional objects work and to be able to break things maybe in or visualize them as like simplified geometric form such as cubes, um, cylinders, spheres, things like that. I think that's a really really useful drawing device which is a lot more constructive and is almost entirely divorced from a more shape uh, translation optical uh, way of working um, it, it exists in, a, in, a, in a, an entirely different realm. It's almost on an opposing side of the spectrum. It, it's something that more like concept artists might use or or people who are like designing or maybe more illustrative but um, but even like old school illustrators and um, you know a lot of painters do like to visualize this as well and I think it, it it, it's really a really good tool to to learn more so if 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 it's not like i i myself i've had to practice um this exclusively um so so only working with line and trying to draw form and instead of relying on like shadow shapes or or whatever shapes are in the image um to sort of ignore that and try and only think about form and um, mass. So you can see the different um, drawing devices I use on this horse. Um, for example, um, f first I, I draw it out in a sort of silhouette style, like a pink silhouette of a horse. But then I, tr I try and use like negative and positive space to establish like leg positioning um, and then I I try to uh, move around key anchor points um, and I, I also want to get this uh, you see I, I draw a kind of a line around the kind of the butt area of the horse to get a sense of curved volume and I think like line is really strong in areas like this instead of maybe doing that with a, a with gradated tone that wraps around like very subtly which takes almost a lot of work to get right you can just sort of do it in one line like I, I wouldn't like the the black here was just to like more visualize it or more get a, get a sense of it but it's not meant to be a a line that will exist there later on it, it's to be improved upon down the line. Blobby, dude, fuck, this is so hard. We need to like type it together. Pretty much for me, it's like just eliminating as many variables as possible when making an image. So I start out use like pretty much like um, creating like the limitations of like really strong color so I can separate um, my temperatures and shadows and nothing but vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines and constructing an image of flat and getting it to just be as, as like strong of a design as possible and constantly remaining like that I'm setting myself up to eliminate other variables for form and all that take place. So pretty much I'm just constructing light and shadow and design using those principles. And then, you know, I can start bringing form into it. Um, the issue with that is like, once you start getting too myopic, you could lose your design. So you kind of have to go back and forth between the early elements of how you started and building upon that. So that's probably how it goes. It's, it's, it's pretty much just like, I know we're working on a 2D surface, but bringing 2D to 3D. 2D to 3D, leaving areas of 2D, and then the illusion of 3D, and jumping back and forth between those dimensions.
I, I catch myself like misunderstanding a certain form based off red herring, like the corners of the mouth. I'll put them in the wrong place because I'm misunderstanding the cylinder of the teeth and the symmetry of that cylinder. Like I catch myself just <laughs> being misguided by uh, certain indica false indications and losing the the like the primary um, path of light over basic forms. Like, does that make sense? Like, it's like a symmetry I issue usually. So that's when the um, and I'm talking purely about faces because <laughs> because that's when that matters so like i think i get what you mean th th this uh drawing here was like an example of me trying to use maybe like horizontal horizontals and verticals and uh maybe drawing shadow shape a bit more um but really i should have been thinking more about the overall blobby form or like the, the, the like the shape of um mass and I should be trying to draw mass rather than uh, draw like maybe exactly where the features lie um, like it, I, I lost sense of the whole by trying to get into these like minute little shapes uh, and yeah sometimes when you rely on like on how the light is hitting it uh, sometimes you can you can rely on the wrong drawing device I think I mean, I still think uh, like flat shapes and uh, stuff like that is good to get in just rough proportions of maybe a whole scene. But after that, you you sort of need to start constructing them geometrically, I think. Uh, make sure that they have a sense of mass uh, m more than maybe the exact, like, not even exact, but you know it's got it's got to all feel like it sort of falls into place um point, point. i think i get what you mean but... yeah that's exactly what i mean like i'm wait there i think some when i know i've got it right everything kind of like links together like a chain it's like kind of just like like clicks into place and i'm like ah oh, there it is now i can now i can actually start fussing with uh features um but like most times I can't get it to that place. <laughs> Everything just, it's like pushing around. I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, like melting ice or something. It just gets more and more formless because I'm making bad decisions. Unless I do the thumbnail thing and then I can usually pull it back, which has been totally life-changing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, this is something I, I have a lot of issue with, like with, with with what you're describing um in a way that i mean does it really matter if you know exactly how the cylinder of the teeth works and functions i mean in all references or whatever it it it's it's never the same you know so like why why would you like try and and study and learn all those things if like, you know, when you when you have a reference and you know someone's tilting their head and like it's just you just put it in where where it is where it's supposed to be on the actual image you're painting, right? Um, I'm not sure if you're thinking. I mean, like understanding a skull. <laughs> uh, I do. I guess kind of mean that, that's probably helpful, but I mean just like the idea of a cylinder. Cause, cause oftentimes I can't, I, I mean, I try to paint what I'm seeing, but I, I fall short. And if I use the guidance of a basic shape, um, I know things will fall approximately where they should be and make just make logical sense i think that the problem with not 
using like cylinders and thinking with three-dimensional form is that you'll always sort of be beholden to the reference image and the exactitudes of that reference image to get what you want. Um, Whereas with more like a constructive method, you can simplify a lot more easily. You can um, you can you can make things work with a, a lot less uh, by just you know having a different way of positioning um, uh, uh, elements of like the face or this, that, or the other. I think I think there's so much advantage to uh, learning this way of working. Um, you know, uh, I want to get to that fucking Kaufman goodness, and that that's it's essential. You know. I mean, I do, I do disagree. I mean, maybe we are saying the same thing, but I mean that, um, it's not like I get to, I want to get to a point where the drawing is there, and now I can be free. You know, like now I can really do what I want. Um. I feel like I'm I'm like beholden to the same idea the whole time and um I I need to be like more and more specific toward that idea every time and so like if the drawing is in place like if things are kind of locked like okay so first if i get like a, a certain gradient of the like a color gradient of the face down and i'm happy with that then i switch my eyes to look for like accurate angles or something like that and then i try to get that right or t you know to the point where i'm happy and then i switch my eyes to look at a different aspect of that reference like i, f I feel i'm always going back to it Right now, anyway. <clears throat> okay, well, I, I, I get what you mean. Um, and, you know, I can see the benefit of that, for sure. Um, but I, I don't know. I think what I meant was like, um, <clears throat> like, you know, even, even if you know something like that, right? And you have like a specific image and, you know, the head is like, in a weird position and like half of the mouth seems to be like you know disappearing um then you might just be better off with you know like suggesting that kind of vague area instead of like constructing it and having like this kind of general general generalization of of like a mouth um i don't know but i agree with you know what you said about um Come on, for fuck's sakes, uh, you know, the, the, the combination, like the hybrid of the two. Yeah, but if, yeah, the hybrid, but it, it like, I don't know, if you know what the shape is, then that'll inform how you imply it, right? No, Hillary, it's essential that we agree, okay? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think knowing the form uh, can help you uh, imply things in a different way than how you might do otherwise. Um, you know, you can make suggestive marks uh, uh, using a different drawing device, I think. Um, it's just another tool in the toolbox, you know, but it's quite a powerful one because it can kind of do quite a lot uh, and it's incredibly powerful in that respect. When, there's a, when you're faced with certain images, there's, sometimes there are really things that you know that you want to get out of it. Like some things that you feel like are very important. For instance, how the, the, the shapes are interacting with each other. You like the kind of arrangement of pattern within that and that's important to you. Then, for instance, I might suggest working more uh, tonally um, for as long as you can. Maybe with like the, the, the slightly the right the, the the colors that you that you know you want, but you want to just work with negative and positive uh, space more than 
ha having too many colors influence the design of your shapes. Um, and equally, this method doesn't exclude working with line earlier on. Like the first line, like the first marks I make, I would consider technically line. Uh, line, it's it's really not abandoning line and saying it it, it should should uh, go away, but it's really just having it consistently used throughout the process and not just subjugating it to the the initial part and then leaving it for forever else because line is so powerful in what it can can do and how it can influence your image it's kind of foolish to just uh just only have it at the start even like the reconstruction uh phase like how nicholas Aribe uses line he he you know he might blob in all these 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 rough tones and then come back later and add anatomy over the top and then re-blob it again like essentially this way of working was developed from uh seeing nicholas Aribe work but also also, it's my attempt at trying to work out how, <laughs> what kind of mindset you need to have to be able to make work like Ruprecht von Kaufmann, essentially. What, I want to know what he's responding to, uh, how he's making his work, um, how he comes to the decisions and con conclusions he does. Um, obviously, he's at the highest level any painter really uh, can be. But um, I feel like he works very, very. He works very intuitively, and he definitely listens to his his heart a lot when he makes his work. Um, but he also strives to um, reach a level of sort of meditative objectivity. I think with his work, he he likes to try and see it. Uh, as an outsider uh, might see his work at, at every stage during it, um, but he also he also works with extreme limitations in being able to to get what he wants. Um, Rupert von Kaufmann works within a very uh, condensed tonal and color uh, range. Uh, I think this really helps him be more creative earlier on in what he does uh, in uh, developing his his work he, he he works from abstraction to resolution it's it's the same way that he he constructs his image it it, it does come from this like otherworldly um, felt subconscious interpretive um, translation initially and then he uh, works to refine that and um, polish that to get what he wants. I think there's a particular freedom in being this loose this early on as well. It's it's so much more fun for one. Uh, you can resolve an image or know that you don't need to invest that much time longer in your image. Uh, or you can determine whether it's just failing as a whole a lot sooner than uh, later on if you had like sunk a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, I think that's quite an advantage of working in this way, just to sort of get you to a point of uh, n of helping you realize what it is you you want further from it. So over the course of the painting, our uh... We, we have to sort of distance ourselves more and more from the reference image um, or not be too too uh, beholden to it. Um, only take information uh, from it that you feel like could your image could benefit from. Um, it no longer is a 
a sort of template on which to uh, copy. It's now just something, uh, something to roughly compare to to see if you're on the right track. Um, so the, the way the reference informs my subsequent color choices is instead of me looking at the exact color that I see in the reference, I want to see what the relationships are doing instead, um, which is to mean how intense or how desaturated are they going in relationship to one another. I want to look at that aspect rather than like the literal colors themselves because that will inform what my colors need to be doing um, in proportion to one another. In, in proportion to one another. Uh, that's important whenever you're working with color that is more your own. Um, that's what you have to sort of be concentrating on and not getting bogged down in what what maybe they're doing within the reference. With oil paint, one of the another one of its strong advantages is its 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 malleability and its characteristics to be able to take back as much as put on. And that taking back uh, isn't to mean that you're going a step back. It's more a, a something that you do to uphold a sense of balance by um, determining that uh, too much detail or, or an over... An, overly uh, descriptive or overly descriptive elements are not serving your your primary focus or goal um, and I think a lot of the painting process is going through in figuring out what elements are important to your story and what aren't Like my goals with painting are to more to continuously improve um, my painting abilities rather than have uh, an image that like one image that works. I'd rather like improve my averages so I can make better and more complicated and more uh, interesting imagery and have it be less of a hassle essentially. Um, and really, the only way to do that is be time efficient with how you you um you pr you practice. And I think um, th this this way of working, this sort of eighty twenty way of working, where um, you're sort of practicing the most important twenty percent of the image, um, like early on, trying to as as like get that down. Um, and so we, we get to a point of whether we even know whether we want to resolve it or not. Like, we have to ask ourselves, what what are we trying to get out of resolving an image? What is the, the, the purpose? Is it just to see what it will look like? Or do you want to sell your work? Or are you trying to just learn? And if you are trying to learn, you only need to take an image as far as it, like, it, it presents you with new... Um, new problems that you haven't solved before and um, until you've solved all those uh, you, there's still things to potentially learn. I think you'll learn a lot more by making a lot more and more images getting them to a kind of rough level of resolution and then moving on to a new one and um, the sort of culminated um, lessons you learn between all of those will will help you when you want to really actually finalize something and make something finish because you can utilize all the things that you've learned in every other image and um, see how they can come into play here.
one thing I, I quite like to do uh, <clears throat> is actually use a small brush to cover large areas um, with like a very quick amount of lines um, like a series of lines to sort of create like a, a you, you can sort of create like a half tone pattern this way and sort of get a level of optical blending by having two colors hit up against each other um, and then sort of a third color emerging or a third tone emerging from that uh, you know in a kind of uh, crosshatch similar way but I don't tend to do crosshatching um, I find it really gross personally but uh, something I like to do is fill large uh, areas of of space or color with a uh, small brush but but fill in the area very very quickly and very very immediately um, to and what you can do with that is what, what happens with that is you can imbue it with um, a different kind of energy uh, it will have a kind of broken element to it uh, which can um, develop a, a whole different kind of aesthetic uh, than otherwise filling it in too flatly and um, what you can also do with these lines is have them correspond to say maybe like the simplified form of that so say like walls on the side you, you can see I've done just up up down up down up down uh, and then on top it's it's left right left right um, like horizontally but also having it like done diagonally or 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 if I don't want it to adhere to form to it to kind of wave around a little bit but you can indicate things um, by how you fill in these uh, shapes of color and um, like you can see with lines I do on the horse, I try and like the, the colored lines I do on the horse, I try and have them adhere roughly to my my basic understanding of the form at that time. And <clears throat> I think I try and make all my brush strokes or direction to have to have a reason for them to be done in that way, like whether it's diagonal or left or right or whatever, it needs to have some logic behind it and I don't like if I can help it, and I, I I don't want to neglect that because I can simultaneously s solve two problems at once: one by correcting the color, and another by indicating another aspect to that object um, that I might want to translate. And then that can sometimes bring things to a level of resolution uh, before, um, well, not before, but in lieu of a more descriptive um, or having too many other elements uh, come into play to uh, bring it to that uh, resolve. So the, the horse is being hit by kind of cooler light but I never really wanted to go too cool with it. I wanted to keep it more in like dulled purples um, and maybe grey at most which gives an, a, an illusion of blue. I think, uh, in contrast to all this warmth that's going around. And that that's enough. Um, if I had it like too blue, it, it might lose a sense of realism that it does need. Um, you know, I don't want to exaggerate everything, um, otherwise it will uh, lose a sense of place and environment that needs um, realism to keep it grounded somewhat. I think successful painting always sits between this hybrid of realism and abstraction. Um, a sort of a, a perfect balance between giving the viewer just enough um, but not too much to be able to then paint an image in their head uh, or complete the story in their, in their own imagination. Um, which will always be a much more vivid, beautiful picture than what you could hope to paint, I believe. 
Um, you, you, a, paint, a good painting should evoke those sensations um, in its sort of interpretive qualities. Like sometimes if you can't make out what objects are, you don't need to go and zoom in and then understand them and then um, zoom into your image and then put them in because uh, like with a better knowledge of what they are, it, it sometimes isn't necessary because initially you didn't know what these things were so you don't need to, uh, to put them in because they were inherently uh, very, uh, it was it was ne it was never important to your initial pull of the image to know exactly what they were, so uh, just just paint them as these vague little things. But when we, when we break reality with our with our marks and our uh, when our painting, we can create a new enhanced reality essentially a. A greater sense of the the truth that we felt, uh, or how the image makes us feel, on on a kind of level that realism can't really uh, describe uh, fully or that comprehensively because it's very limited. Um, so this is where really exciting work uh, becomes really exciting work. It's when it breaks reality to invent a, a better one. Um, and yeah it's like how 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 do i do that um like i i always struggled with making being creative i always struggled with color i always struggled with generating ideas essentially i always thought of myself as very uncreative but i found the sort of secret to creativity and the secret to many uh issues that i had within my previous work um, the secret or the answer really is an embrace of of chance and um, you could call them mistakes but like having like a, a reduction of agency within your work um, so losing a sense of control um, so the the paint and what you're working with is kind of open to the elements it's open to those happy accidents. I think earlier on, that's the best best stage in which that can happen because it won't be too detrimental to your image. So it's really within our best uh, benefit to like utilize that, that freedom of the, of the early stage to really mess around, to really to I explore um, and have things materialize in new and fresh ways because it's we're not overthinking it or we're not resulting too much to um, one very set uh, way of working. What I see some people do is after they develop a knowledge of how to do something um, well, like with drawing or with uh, something like that, it's hard to to not use it. Um, so I see people who have very good drawing skills uh, want to get down a, a good drawing first and then do the like color and stuff later. But I think... I, I think that is a misuse of it if you're just doing it by default. Um, say for instance, like putting anatomy or um, using your knowledge of anatomy uh, when um, constructing a, a, a face or a portrait, I don't think you want to be using all of that or thinking about like the zygomatic major like straight away too much um so say when i'm doing portraiture or, or people or something like that i want to you know see them more as just m m more like like a, a head is more like an oval shape or like a, a simplified form shape to depict like the whole mass uh of the object or person rather than have all of the, the knowledge sort of be present at once and try and simultaneously 
get all of it right like i i just want to get like this make sure the the head is just in proportion to other shapes first before getting into the minutia of the anatomy and um these other aspects that uh that aren't uh, don't really benefit us to be that specific about at that early of a stage i think later on when it comes to um, pushing the color and the shape around and and manipulating it to be conscious of how form works and stuff like that but to not overthink it unless it's necessary unless you need more form or form is very very specific to your intent and interests for the image you don't need to use it as much uh, when creating like a painting like this it's it's really not necessary So with this painting, you'll see me cycle through uh, quite a, uh, like cycle around the image, um, juggling uh, a few different elements uh, in, <clears throat> in proportion to one another. So the main one is obviously the space, because that's what I established first. Um, I feel like it has to have a good sense of space. And then the horse would be secondary, um, but kind of primary, a primary focus. Uh, the space is sort of doesn't really count, but it but it does. And then from there, uh, it's a lot of it is the sort of the, the the shape arrangement of the objects in in space. But really, it's these two lamps on either side. Uh, I think they're like the supporting cast of this image, and it's sort of what I uh, what I try and focus more on getting right. Like those, those four, three things, um, getting those right and ev having everything else built off that rough uh, coat hanger, um, because yeah, they're 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 the primary um, characters ca characters in play here. So it's why I spend um, like quite a lot of time in the, of this lamp with this lamp in the bottom left corner. Um, because, uh, after I sort of establish a good sense of a horse, um, I've got to now have it fit in with everything else. And, um, I, I, I want to, I want to explore all my options of the, these lamps. You see, I'll, I'll paint this lamp about 10 different times, maybe, uh, in the corner here. Um, because I want to get the one lamp that works best, um, ideally, and I will only know that after I've painted nine bad ones. I kind of, o over painting lots and lots over the years, what has really helped me um, actually get better at painting is to sort of treat it a lot more mechanically, a lot more like a, a sort of a... a, a wall uh, a wall someone who paints walls like a decorator painted decorator how they apply paint and stuff like that I, I see on building sites really fantastic examples of beautiful paint abstraction done completely accidentally and I, I feel it's such a strange sort of phenomenon that to get like the most exciting brushwork is sort of happened completely by accident or with no intent to have it it's just all function it's all to have functional qualities and i think that like understanding that really helped my my paint work essentially um when one time i was painting some stairs and i mean physical stairs not a picture of stairs and i was applying paint and i wanted to get the job done as quickly and as efficiently as i could with these shapes and how I was manipulating the paint was really wild to me because I was like, holy shit, this is some fucking killer brushwork happening within like these stairs. Uh, why can't I paint like this um, normally? And um, when I'm actually painting an oil painting and I think part of it was the mentality. Part of me was just, this has to be filled in. This, this has to be filled in like this in a, in a quick, in a quick way and it needs to just sort of 
look good enough from a distance because the first time I was doing it I was trying to fill in all the exact lines and trying to like uh, like get it all neat and tidy and it was taking me fucking ages and um so I was like oh, fuck how do... like I I never look at these stairs I never like pay too much attention to these stairs so how how detailed and rendered do they need to be so I just went downstairs I look uh, like further down in, in the kind of studio building that I'm in. I went further down the stairs and, and seen how someone else had painted uh, the, uh, a lower uh, set of stairs. I wanted to see how they'd done it because to me there was no issues with that paintwork. I, I walked up and down those stairs and never noticed any like slight deviation from the line. But I went closely and I examined the, the stairs under the same scrutiny I was examining my own stairs when I was painting them and I realized this it was so loose it was so like sloppy but it didn't matter like um no one fucking goes up the stairs like that and, and examines them and be like you know that's wrong that they they work they, they they function at the distance that they are viewed at and that's um quite important to to remember that um People aren't coming up to your stairs looking at them with that much scrutiny and um, so I went back upstairs and yeah I started painting quite sloppily and, and quickly and, and just wanted to get the job done like them and that that's when I started thinking about paint like slightly differently in the in this more mechanical um, cold way but just to serve more function and that's kind of how I tree paint now it, it's in this kind of more kind of more st stupid but f functional way like i'm not like i'm trying i'm trying to just kind of clumsily jam it in uh or, ju or just change the color as quickly as possible um fairly aggressively um until it gets to what i want quicker um and then the rest sort of falls into place um, as you're sort of doing that, um, it, it's it's sort of like good paint work. I think is just uh, it's just our thought process um, being slightly uh, or, or or the the process on, on how we uh, made the image. This sort of s still being there a little bit um, that kind of human quality to it. Um, I think that that's one thing that help me think about paint but uh I, I again i still do i still do think about paint in this way um like so when when i when i've taught this uh way of working before i i call the first step working stupid it's quite difficult i i see people struggle with this way of working when they have quite solidified habits and they uh, are, get completely lost earlier, earlier on in knowing what to do next. But I think you really have to nurture that uh, responsiveness to your gut reaction uh, quite a bit and just try and resolve the, the biggest thing uh, that is an influence on your image earlier than later. And so with environment, if you know you're working with environment or a scene or anything like that, that's, that means working on that, establishing those shapes, establishing those colors, establishing a sense of a scene before you would maybe get into the figure or the horse or this, that or the other. You have to establish the whole thing first. It's very important. Otherwise, um, your images, if you have like things in an environment or things within a scene, they will feel uh, divorced from that scene because they will be looked at in too many bit part ways rather than a sort of juggling of the whole and having them all be almost part of the same entity rather than a collection of individual objects, but all sort of, it all needs to kind of blur together because really that painting, you're, it's, it's more than the sum of its parts. Though, though, those things become part of the experience. Uh, they become like, like actors in a play giving the audience um, a particular feeling or emotion. One that is hopefully similar to what you felt when you 
um, got that sort of tingle uh, when you first encountered the 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 idea or the reference. Um, really, we we want to f like put that on a plate for other people. You want to show them what you see and um, have them be able to see things in your eyes. Uh, that that's sort of a, a what, what we really want with paint. We're trying to communicate our feelings and our thoughts with paint um, and have those communicated effectively. And, um, you know, if you're trying to communicate everything in one go, then the viewer won't know what to look at or what you consider more important. Or, you know, you have to look, you have to see the advantages of these reductive um, processes, these, these, uh, the going too far, then going back. So I think one of the most important aspects of working this way is to never have anything be too resolved in relationship to other things or be at a kind of be trapped within a different thought process to everything else. You need everything to sort of work harmoniously with one another and uh, respond off of one another. So I don't like to um, look at something in isolation too much. I always want to be seeing the whole scene at once and it's why I, yeah, I don't zoom in apart from the one time I did and it led me to fuck up because I got too myopic, I got too hung up on some like small little details because I, I wasn't thinking briefly and that sort of set a chain reaction. You can see it with the horse when I zoom into it. Um, it's sort of a, a sort of chain reaction of sort of bad decisions and I kind of tilted uh, into this this kind of mode of not really thinking when I'd sort of I, when I should have uh, been a bit more considerate about my what my next step should be so I, I've kind of like I noodle along in the in the first session and I get it to a good level of resolve that I like just using solid color just uh, you know posterized kind of shapes but but also uh, kind of a lot of line being involved as well. And um, you see, it, t it takes me a while until I get to the thin, spindly little lines because they're, they're, they're such a, they, they have such a small visual impact on the image. They're only there to make micro adjustments. And I don't want to be making micro adjustments too soon before I know uh, what the rest of my image is going to be looking like. I, I put them in here or there to to nudge things in the right direction perhaps or make little little theories but for most of the time I if I if I'm working with thin line for a bit I I don't want to stay with that I just want to touch up a bit with thin line and then go back to to being blobby again I, I sort of work in this kind of rocking horse kind of manner where I'm going loose to tight to loose again to tight back and forth back and forth like a pendulum slowly middling out essentially that's how i i visualize um, my working method um you know getting that beautiful goldilocks just right porridge um like whenever i'm adding line I always try and add color to it, like, and a, a considered color to it. And that can be on different levels of consideration. Sometimes it's a sort of, if I need to like really correct something, I might just use pure color as line. So my, I can mentally see it as something different from the actual image and more like a correction line, you know, like just a pure red or something like this. But I also might try and find an in-between, like f uh, it, instead of being, pure red it might be like a pink and I or an intense pink and I might put it in 
part where that might correspond with an intense pink, like part of the nose or, or an eye or, or something, I don't know, something, you know, where it might make sense to have that color. And um, I use that to have it. And sometimes it, 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 it works just on it on its own somehow. Like I want, I want to talk about. I I do want to talk about uh, our relationship with the the reference imagery that we use, um, because it's it's that's one of the strange kind of ones that I don't think it's spoken about too much. Um, but it really it drives everything else uh, from there. It 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 makes it informs all our decisions and what subsequent actions we take um so when we're determining whether an image is going well or not it's it's always in a sort of uh sort of triangle relationship between the reference that we have whatever we're referencing our source material the image we have in front of us as another uh reference point and then a projected idea of where we want the image to go or the ideas we have for it and um during the the start i think that's when uh we might be in conversation more with the reference we want to just take out what we see what we feel about it um put that down and have that established um and then from there we slowly move more and more away from a strict adherence to the reference. Um, and then we're sort of entering a new realm of um, sort of what is working for your image and then uh, where the aspects of the original image are n no longer... Um, benefiting us like every single minute detail is never really all that needed um, Say for instance the the object in the left corner under the lamp. I never wanted to really Understand what it was. Uh, it was never important for me in the, my initial uh, Reaction to this image. It was always just an abstract shape of sort of nothingness I, I didn't care to look at it for, for longer and I never really did it only sort of existed as a, a compositional device to possibly move the eye around. That's all I really saw it as, just a collection of shapes. And that's always what it should really ever be. And so, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to see how far I could take th this solid color with this. Um, in setting myself up for uh, a lot of an easier time later on when it comes to the more painterly aspects of blending and um, you know uh, edge edge control and things like that which happens in the the second session I I wanted to to get it to a point where I'm happy with it I can archive it and uh, have something back to refer to so now I have the original reference image and then I have something that I'm happy with, something that I'm pleased with that has a level of resolution, um, you know, that uh, I can be satisfied with. And then I, I, you can compare the two. So I, th I think working this way will really force you to um, understand uh, what it is you're working with. Um, because you'll be spending spending quite a bit of time in the simplified uh, version of what it is you're doing. Um, you'll spend a lot of time trying to resolve that and trying to figure out uh, what is needed and what is not needed. And you sort of you you need to uh, 
you always need to go too far and be able to see where the happy middle is. It's it's just a it's a part of the process that is needed because if you don't go too far and overstep or overcomplicate or this that or the other, you won't know where the fine line of the balance that you need is essentially. Like I I always think of Goldilocks uh, when thinking about this in trying something oh that's too cold that's too hot this is just right that's sort of how I approach image making um, just get it out there saying okay too cold change it oh too hot okay that's just right or if not you know go going from sort of one extreme to the other Whenever I'm correcting uh, my image, um, I like to look at what is the the most simple way to quickly correct it um, at any given time. So what is the largest field of color I can change um, that will help uh, what it is uh, I need from the image at that moment in time. Um, sometimes the solution can be just to completely remove an element that is undesirable or is giving you grief or even if you can't like properly draw it uh, your ability isn't strong enough just or, or you fucked up so many times you can just just cut it out or remove it or put, put like a big shape over it or you know uh, we need to maintain the integrity of the whole image and make sure it's every every little piece is working to maintain the the overall um, because if if there's like an element like if someone's wearing like a shirt that it just it, the color just isn't working for everything else just change the color of the shirt So this is just essentially me um, fucking around with the the brush to see what the fuck it even does and how it manipulates paint. I'm just I I need to do that before I I want to like use it. Um, so I just go and sort of distort the whole thing. So essentially here with all these bits of color like this sort of unblended. Uh, and solidly put down, I wanted to see what it would look like if I would now blend them all together and have them have them sort of react in the same way that oil paint might work or and use the advantages of blending as a separate drawing uh, tool that you can use uh, to manipulate your image. So I, I, I go with... Um, I'm not sure what tool I use, but a, a, a general smudgy brush and this kind of uh, earbud tool, which is something I do use in real life and I think it's a really good tool to have. Um, just cotton earbuds, you get like a, a big pack of them and uh, they, they are great for precision, um, precision uh, adjustments, like micro adjustments of edges or, or removing paint or moving paint around. They're a really great tool, but uh, a dry brush will do just the same with wet paint. So it's th this blending stage is almost as much reductive as it is additive. Um, it's I can simplify a lot more by smudging things together and um, de-emphasizing uh, some harsh lines that aren't really helping the composition. But I have to sort of do this all over. This is like another like iterative step. I'm now in kind of blendy mode. So my, my primary focus is to, to do that, to kind of um, simplify and, um, and uh, reduce in areas that aren't needed. But at the same time, my secondary interest is to slightly push the drawing around just a little bit to, to correct it. Um, but I, I don't wanna I don't wanna 
think too hard. I, I kind of, I, I do do it by, by quick glance, quick, like, uh, sight references and, um, and seeing where, what pops within the original image and what doesn't pop out. Um, this is where squinting can help quite a lot when, when you, you squint hard and you see what sort of fades into obscurity and what remains like popped out and, uh, standing out. Um, I respond to that, um, quite, quite quickly and, and simply, um, So here's a cheap trick for you. Um, if you're kind of painting or like maybe you're painting a face and it's a bit like shitty, you can't kind of work out why. Um, maybe it's too contrasted or the, or the colors don't quite work or the proportions are a bit off. Just fucking blur everything with like a dry brush and have it all kind of m melt into each other like a kind of, uh, like a kind of Gerhard Richter type painting. Um, that somehow corrects uh, a lot of it because you're just eliminating all the the, the wrong decisions and uh, in eliminating uh, bad elements that can be a way forward as much as adding um, positive elements if you get what I mean so we have to really utilize every subtractive um, subtractive tool at our disposal um, and that's that's what I, I, I do end up doing with this with this blendy brush quite a lot um, I'm kind of reducing contrast in a lot of areas where it doesn't need to be where I've over exaggerated things um, like with this horse and as I'm sort of manipulating it uh, it sort of falls into place where it needs to be um, When talking about um, specificity and uh, levels of specificity or degrees of specificity, I like to picture a like a, a brick wall. In the, the, the sort of many ways you can uh, render or or depict a brick wall, for instance. On one hand, you could sit there and draw every single brick in the wall, and that will say brick wall. Like no one will be able to misinterpret that I don't think um, or you could do a wall like a big long shape the same shape size like a big long rectangle and you can have like a few bricks or a few patterns of bricks spread here here kind of almost indiscriminately around this wall like little hints here or there and maybe uh, have some of the edges be a little rough or something like that. You can indicate a whole brick wall without drawing every single little brick within it because the the viewer will know what a brick wall is, what a brick wall looks like. It doesn't need to be told every single brick um, to know that it's a brick wall. Uh, the, the mind will fill in the, the rest. It will just assume the rest is bricks, which is sort of what it does anyway when sort of perceiving an object. We don't simultaneously see every single brick. Now unless the exactitude of all these bricks are like hyper important to what you're saying, which they won't be, um, you can get away with like very few little bricks and then you can think, okay with that simplification and I'm putting that indiscriminately, maybe I could put them there intentionally, like have composition be moved around by how the bricks are there, or or maybe you don't want that, or other things like that you can do when you can be more selective about the bricks you do and don't depict. And everything sort of works in this same way, and um, you want to see how many bricks you can take out um, to be able to have the right amount of bricks to say as much as what you need to, um, with more efficiency or more effectiveness. And so I, I like to I like to see whatever I'm working with in the same way of that of seeing what I can just what I don't have to 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 paint 
because it's not necessary. Um, because it's not necessary. I don't. I don't need it. Um, just so, so I can get what I do need and and uh, work with that. So yeah, this is where I fuck up. Zooming in, zooming in, no, 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 bad, bad, bad. This is a bad habit. We're all guilty of it. The best way, really, to, um, to paint a painting is to stand as far back as a position in which it will be viewed at. So, or just across the room. Like, the further away you can get from your image without it being, like, exhausting, um, the more complete and a, a sense of a whole will be uh, maintained because that will always be what you'll be seeing. Um, so, going in too, too small, too, too detailed, um, you can lose sight of the whole quite easily. Um, so what I was doing here, which I was, which I, which, which tripped me up is as I zoomed in, I was looking at the horse and I think I was trying to get it too exact to the reference. Um, whereas really I, I, I had, didn't have that level of exactitude throughout the process. So I sort of like was trying to you know, fit a square peg into a round hole, it seemed like, and I, it sort of lost the sense of its overall shape, like the horse, and you can see I try and get that back, um, but I feel like I'm at a point, like I compared it very quickly to the stage before, and um, it just, it just felt like I, I shouldn't have done that, and so I quickly re reversed this, um, and just this is where I delete the layer. The, the first one, of the first times I sort of digitally cheated. Um, but really, you could say that's that's kind of like if you, you had had your painting dry, and then um, painted over it, and it sucked. You can always just scrape it back down while it's still wet, or, or rub it away. As long as the painting is sufficiently dry underneath, you can kind of control Z in in real life as well. At least that's what I told myself. But for the sake of demonstration, it was just easier just to go, just to go back. But I, again, I, t I tend to not um, rely on, on these tricks as much because I, I do want to improve my actual drawing and not sort of shortcut my way um, as much as I can. Uh, Like along along the way, it becomes harder and harder mentally to want to change to want to change anything. Um, you know, it's it's called the sunk cost fallacy, where you know if you if you've invested a lot of time in in getting something right in one way, you will be reluctant to to want to reverse or go back and undo all that effort that you have done, but. You, you you have to bite the bullet and um, really recognize when that's happening and not kind of lie to yourself. Uh, I mean, I, I, it, it will happen a lot. It happens with me a lot. I have to sometimes physically destroy paintings just so I don't continue to work on them because I have to realize that I'm just beating a dead horse at this point. Um, you know, not every image has to be a monumental success. Not every image has to be, you, you know be a big broad step each time like it's all about these kind of micro um amalgamations accumulations of uh discoveries um that slow slowly over time um come to a head but uh we, we can only really do that by making it, uh, as many images as we can and uh, so we don't really want to want to get stuck in trying to 
save something that we thought we were really excited about. We just have to, we have to do it again. So after this session, I come back to it uh, an hour or two later. And um, because I want to resolve this now a bit more, I, I then crop my canvas to be more the aspect ratio that I know I want to be working within. I, I, I make those decisions now. And this is kind of like how I would do it uh, with traditional painting. Um, have the composition be a bit more open-ended up until a point where it's like, okay, this is what I'm working with. Now, how can I make it work within these confines? But it took a lot of sort of swimming around and, you know, I expanded the composition um, from the start as well as it sort of grew out and I, and I felt like I needed more space. Um, it, it happened slowly over time. I wanted it to, to sort of organically manifest as much as I, I want everything else to sort of organically manifest. And so here I, fl I flick back and forth between a layer to see um, this is one this is one great thing working digitally what you can do is you can you can make a few kind of decisions so here it's sort of a uh, a tonal thing predominantly with the, the the thing in in the corner on the left here as I kind of reduce the contrast I wanted to see uh, what that did and adding a bit of floor in and flicking around with a couple of layers to see uh, what what adding a few more like brush strokes in certain areas what that does to the image just flicking back and forth um, just because I want to know I want to know what these little decisions I did how they're influencing and this is a really important part of making our work and uh, developing our work is to archive it, archive it as much as we can in in as many different uh, stages, uh, significant stages. If if we have a switch in thought process throughout it, or an idea of something, what what might add, uh, or an idea of of maybe like a new color to add, or a, a new kind of level of aggression with your brush strokes, or something like that, or a new sort of way of thinking. If there's a switch in that, um, it's good to archive just before you make that switch, so you can you can compare whether it was of benefit or of detriment, or where where it was where it did help you or where it did aid you and where it wasn't and then try and find that that balance once again between the two of them um but you can only do this uh through maybe more objective means like this um rather than relying too much on memory because that can be deceptive and you can sort of lose your way if if you haven't archived what you've done uh adequately and that you know that's just taking a photo of it or or a screenshot, or something like that. Um, just, just, just archive your work. Please do it, and refer back to it, and uh, start to sort of look at your work more like a tennis player might observe their serve. Um, just try to um, methodically and objectively look at what you are and and aren't doing and uh, how that's helping what you what you really want to do. One thing I consider a factor in, in our image making uh, process is uh, different different is, is the kind of gaps of time uh, between sessions. I think this is a really it's it's a tool like any other um, that can be uh, n not misused, but uh, it it has its advantages and disadvantages. Basically, I think one of the disadvantages of returning to uh, your painting after a, a period of time is it's hard to get back the same rhythm that you had when you were making it and. Um, Say for instance, when I come back after a session, 
uh, after a break from a session, uh, I might stiffen up somewhat and um, get too tight or, or try too hard to try and um, rein it in, uh, maybe. Whereas, like, that can really, um, really be of detriment to my image when, when that happens, because um, the, 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 the painting becomes this, this uh, cross-contaminated um, mess of two different states of mind, and uh, s s somehow along the way I, I lost sight of my initial like pull of the image, whatever made me start start it and and develop it in um my initial way like i i it's it's a dangerous one um it can happen and it happens still and you have to be very mindful of that uh th these breaks um, they can be very good for obtaining a sense of objectivity and seeing your your work fresh and what needs to change and and uh things like that but the loss of energy is a sacrifice and that can suck especially with with oil painting when you have to wait for it to dry to be able to achieve certain things uh with the paint sometimes you can also lose the impetus to want to even work on it anymore but i mean that's that's fine i think if you don't want to work on an image anymore just just don't just just move on to the next one um or until you can muster up the 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 kind of the will to want to change it or have some kind of reckless abandon so you, you won't have that over precious tightness that can be stifling um you have to kind of play tricks with your mind quite a lot um or just um like what i might do is uh, force myself to to go back with a bigger brush or maybe I might start back on uh, the background or something broad and go again from there whereas the temptation is to go straight to the juicy bits the eyes the horse the you know the bit that we really like about the image so for me um, I you know I did that and that one part where I, I got too bogged down on the horse and I neglected the hole and it, it fell apart. So I had to um, I had to shake myself up again and, and re-remember what it is I was doing and then work broadly again. Uh, we have to sort of wake ourselves up and, and beat out these bad habits that we have. So now I'm painting uh, with a more sort of textured brush. Um, now I'm introducing sort of blending and, and um, texture into the image. I'm sort of just using one brush to uh, build upon that uh, because now it's sort of an established uh, visual device that I have in my image. Um, I can't really go back to this, that solid round brush way of working before because now the image is entirely different. Um, like the elements within it. So I sort of have to play with the elements that I have um, already there and um, use those to push it further uh, into where it needs to be. In the, in the second phase of doing this, I think I changed where I was viewing the reference from and I changed to be observing it from a different screen, which actually had slightly um, overly saturated um, qualities to the screen. It was a bit shitty, but I quite liked that. Um, but also it was positionally different from where it was before. So I couldn't rely on it for exact shape proportion stuff. I had to sort of um, work more responsively to my image, but um, I instead just used it to just get, just maybe see uh, where the balance should lie or have something to um, more viscerally compare to um, along the process. Um, 
and uh, and then later on I end up comparing it to uh, prior states of this image. When, whenever we want to be creative and we want to idea generate and uh, make something, we have to work with the most immediate tool and the most immediate thing we can uh, that changes that. And as long as it's always more correct than, than, than the prior state, then we're on the right track. Um, as long as it's sort of quite, quite bold, I think. Um, it slowly gets down to this sort of refinement, this this chiseling stage later on. But by the end point, I have I'm I'm a lot more confident in what I do and don't need. And uh, at any one time, I I I might get a bit lost, but I always have something that I need to correct. Or, or you know, it's more towards the later stage when you have to strategize and uh, really examine prior states to to know where it needs to end up. Um, but that kind of level of thinking you don't want to have at the start because it's it's an impossible task to make that kind of calculation because you just don't know. You, you won't know until you've done it enough times to be confident with your decisions. And through the process of, of repainting everything again and again and redrawing it again and again, you will have a greater sense of what it is you want. Um, maybe not within this image, but within future images and um, uh, sub subsequent images. And, uh, you know, you have to also experiment with what images you're drawing from and um, what is the most kind of core aspect to each one. So form, color, like, uh, you know, perspective, shape design, like tonal arrangement, like patterns, all these kind of weird things we have to almost experiment with in isolation and then, um, and then try and piece them together in one amalgamation, which is our painting style. So one thing that I that I um, was dancing around with, struggling with, would, would be the light in the uh, in the left side of the image. As it hits the the top of the ceiling, it creates this this shape. Um, and I I tried to indicate that earlier on with solid color, um, but it never really worked. It felt too I don't know like. It, it couldn't be described in such simple ways, so I, I thought it would be better just to eliminate it or only slightly allude to it with a bit of with a bit of tone, but I really didn't want to have it as extreme as the reference imagery because I don't think it served um, my image, at least. It wasn't something that I, I could rely upon to improve what I was working with. And you can see with these lights, I, I try and take alternative approaches to... Uh, make them make them vibrate in a way that they that they um they do within the image but without the intricate diffuse light glow that they give i wanted to kind of make them glow using maybe more line or directness um so i just pump a bit of like electric color in like after after i sort of get the right tone that i want i try to uh see maybe if I can intensify it with color. Um, and I like to do that with light quite a lot is have it maybe a value down or two uh, from what, what I observe. And so I can punch it with a bit of color. And I think that color can go a long way to give it a sense of vibrancy. Um, as well as using like these kind of gesticulatory uh, squiggles to kind of give a, a sense of emanating light um, in a sort of abstracted uh, in an abstracted way but I can use these weird uh, depictions uh, with line to manipulate the composition a bit more or or have it fit in with 
the environment that I've set, which is a bit more liney or a bit more illustrative, perhaps. Um, I think that was a solution that I think worked quite well. So you can see I'm fucking around with the ceiling quite a lot and I don't quite know how to get that transitional effect as it goes from dark to light to one end of the room. I don't really want to fully gradate that. Um, I need to keep it kind of roughly as uh, rendered as everything else. And I can only think to do that with these kind of squiggly halftone um, shapes at the top. Um, you can see that the lines almost give it a, a sense of perspective in how they kind of sort of generate outward from the corner uh, and then kind of come in on the other way and then you have you know a, a basically very abstracted representation of what is going on over there um, and they can kind of be enjoyed for those abstract qualities in themselves but I um, I really wanted to, to to kind of leave them as simple as possible because they're, it's an extremely supporting cast. I wanted to to be an element of the image but a, a very secondary aspect of it and um, it, it, it's tricky to to work out that, that balance. And again, you can only do it through sort of continued uh, iterative um, renderings of that, continued um, ways of specifying it.
so towards the, the, the later the later stages of the image that's when I might play with more interesting brushes or um, materials that make the paint fall in kind of more more exciting ways and expressive ways I, tr I try and get like this sort of fuzzy textured brush and then I have this other raking brush that I use um, I, I use this later on to sort of give texture and give uh, um, sort of visual interest to the, the, the sort of solid color shapes that I have um, I, th I think it's kind of it's not pointless to do this too early on but if you're painting over certain things again and again um, we don't it, like those things are going to get covered they they won't they might not be there at the end um, so the texture is kind of irrelevant earlier on it's only a, a relevant thing at the end um, so that that's where I, st I start to do it to give it a more level of finality um, because I think what it does is it is it it it, it breaks up some of that um, monotony. Um, if you have it too textured, things can look like a bit like shitty HDR, and you don't necessarily want that. You don't want all these little micro tones and micro deviations of color to be fucking up the kind of the the core shapes and uh, like arrangements of uh, pattern that you have you you, you really don't want to um, lose the sense of that so I I kind of I, I, I do I do have a a definitely more of a um, methodical way of thinking later on it's a bit more strategic it's a bit more trying to now use everything that I've learned from making this image plus um, what I've learned from making previous images where I tackle similar objects in space and I, and I, I play with different um, deviations of representation to be able to um, resolve certain areas Here's a point where I just try and fuck around with just random shapes and and try and see if I could just obliterate the left side uh, with a weird shape. Um, I didn't really want that to be how I resolved it, um, but when I got into this kind of playful shape mode, some of the some of the um, shapes still continue through to the end. Like mainly this kind of pink squiggle that 
happened near the horse. All I wanted to do was just bring more emphasis to the left side more than the right and have a bit more pull compositionally over to the left. Um, and sometimes that's what I might use squiggles or marks or, or hits of color to do is just as little points to rebalance the whole composition. It doesn't quite matter what they literally mean, but I want to uh, maintain the, the, the whole composition. I, I don't want it to, to be imbalanced just because uh, of, you know, very like, like I didn't utilize a, a very easy and quick fix. Um, you know, we can do that in many ways, but that was quite a quick and easy way just to pull it a bit more over here or, or give a bit more emphasis on the horse, but also this kind of scratchy effect that kind of happens as well. It, it is quite congruous with ev with the rendering of, of everything else within it. So within this environment, it, it still makes sense. And, you know, the vibe is kind of mysterious. It's kind of, it's a bit dark and it's a bit weird. And so things almost have to sit in this kind of slight nonsense uh, realm of non-reality or, you know, um, you know, th these kind of little lines and, and, and dots and, and, and shapes that kind of permeate around the image, they, they do a lot to the feel.
So I think the image really comes to life in the, in the later stages. It looks like resolved later on when I start to use whatever trick under my disposal to be able to resolve it. And at this point, I, I make a conscious decision to resolve it. I would be a fool to not take advantage of all the aspects of uh, working digitally, which includes, um, you know, um, things to do with layers, uh, quickly flicking between the two of them, um, anything to do with these weird fancy little brushes. Um, there, there are many, many more things that, that I could do. Like I be, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to the point of like lassoing objects and making them bigger and stuff like that. I don't really want to do that, but you, you could do that. Um, um, the, the main thing I, I did do is, um, after I thought it was complete, um, during the, the end of the third session, I thought, yeah, that's resolved. After I, I cropped it once more, um, I'm not really sure why. I think I wanted to emphasize the horse more with my, my way of thinking and just completely remove the left side, which was the weakest part of this image. Um, I wanted to just straight up remove it because I felt it was weak, but I think that was where I fucked up because I failed to recognize the importance of its weakness or its sort of, its sort of uh, underdeveloped area, underdeveloped uh, rendering. Um, it it was actually again like a, a supporting cast in all of this. Like um, it really helped put that horse in space, and I, I completely cut it, and and I think I, I ruined the image there. So when it came to like thinking this image was finished. I referred back to an an, an older uh, an older version of it, or even just the um, the original reference itself. No, 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 no. I, I I referred back to an older iteration of the drawing to see maybe what I had lost and what I had gained. Um, referring back to a point which I really quite did quite like it, and I was like, oh right, no. What's really the the main thing that has really changed that is. That is hurting this is the, the the ratio, the size, the composition. So, um, I just went back and reversed it. Um, I overlaid the original that I liked over the top of over the top of the um, the one that I, I felt was complete, and I just erased as much of it as I could in a, this kind of scratchy way. Uh, because I only wanted the borders there, uh, sort of stitching it together, and then uh, that creates this weird, this 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 weird kind of choppy texture that happens, um, which I really quite liked. I think it obscured the the background a lot more, and have had things kind of chop into each other in ways that I wouldn't have done manually. But now I, after I've done that, I see that um, that's quite a that's quite an important thing i think to the soul of this image is to have you know i think one of the traps of of working with objects and perspective is that we want to get them right so we try and get those lines all fucking great and groovy but they lose an energy of their kind of uh blobbiness um and also they don't really need to be that exact um the eye sort of fills in the rest so I sort of regained some of that looseness that happened at the start that um, I realized now was more necessary and I, and I should uh, consider that a lot more. Um, I do have that tendency to overly resolve things and it's still that fine balance I'm trying to, um, to fully understand uh, what it needs. But again, it was informed by a prior archival um, image that really helped me to understand what it is I, I I wanted more. And so I extend out the right a little bit and really sloppily just, just fill it in with, with solid color again. Um, because it sits in the periphery, it doesn't really quite matter, but I wanted to push that light in a bit more and then trying to just with a bit of color fill, fill it in with whatever I could. And I quite like just that abstract um, quality to those parts. Um, I think they're actually quite exciting. Um, 
and really so much of the excitement of the brushwork and stuff like that it's um i didn't even know until after i zoomed in later and had a like a closer look at it um i think that's quite good um because it 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 the medium just fell into place like it, it if it works in the zoomed out way it will work uh zoomed in um i think that's the the, the, the trick um i think i think that's another trick to good brushwork is or, or good paintwork is that as long as it the the hole is maintained from a distance up close it can be what whatever the fuck um Whatever the fuck, uh, it, 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 it. Sometimes paintings of mine, um, when I've done quite a good painting, um, oh, I, I, I quite like it. Uh, but it's something new to me. Um, there's the instinct to just leave it as it is and uh, not want to change it. But for me, that's not really enough. I need to then see, well, how can I destroy it? Or how can I add to it? Or how can I take it even further? And that lesson is usually a lot more valuable than the kind of the value of having one good piece. Like the lesson is more important to... Um, you know the knowledge is more important to have in your repertoire than uh to always have a sort of never answered question and not really knowing uh you know it it mean you'll not really know with full confidence every decision that you make because there'll be lingering thoughts each time so you kind of have to you know one of the best things you can do is you know destroy your work after making it good um or trying we're not necessarily destroying it but trying to take it further like trying to build upon it and oftentimes yeah it might lead to failure which is what has happened with mine um but uh you know sometimes it's worth it it's 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 helped me um even knowing how that i shouldn't do that again in certain instances that's still a, a valuable lesson um and I know more about paint because of it. Um, but sometimes like when doing like a, a, a study of a bust, um, I'm like, cool, okay, I've done this study. Now I've done this painting, it's complete. You know, you can have a photograph that you can upload it, whatever, you, you've done it. But what, what, what next? What else can I add to it? And so, you know, I add like random collage elements or scribble over it or this, that or the other. There's... There's, uh, I've learned a lot more by doing shit like that than just leaving it and never really knowing. Um, but it's something you have to um, cultivate over time. This reckless abandon is, is definitely something that takes time to, to hone and work on. Um, but your paintings will be stronger for it um, because really you'll be painting a lot more and drawing a lot more than what you would um trying to get it right exactly like the first time um a painting is a, is a layered process it's it 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 shouldn't come easy if it comes too easy um then you're not learning essentially if you know what the outcome will be before you start the image then you're not evolving and you're not developing your work Being aware of our intent when we're making an image is is really is really crucial to having something be a success or not. Um, because oftentimes, say if you're just learning, um, if you just if you just want to learn how to get better, 
then um, failure and mistakes and everything like that, they're not a necessarily negative thing. If anything, they're an essential thing for being able to have a greater understanding of what it is you want uh, in the future by essentially eliminating all the things you don't, but you can only do that by doing them. Um, so if we are trying to get better, we are trying to learn, then we have to embrace uh, methods that are prone to having it look ugly, essentially, uh, not being vis you know, it not holding up visually. Um, um, by the end, like we need to sort of sit with these failures and try and understand why they don't work uh, and not be too discouraged um, when they don't. 